Tonight's discussion will be on the topic, compassion fatigue in the professional workplace. The genesis for this conversation came out of stories of burnout in both the medical and legal professions during the COVID-19 pandemic. News reports of mass retirements rocked the landscape. All of a sudden, it seemed like things weren't quite like they were before. The term compassion fatigue started to be identified as a culprit. Earlier this year, we reached out to ODA member and frequent speaker, Susan Koenig, and asked her if she would be willing to organize and moderate a panel discussion on the topic here tonight. She graciously accepted our request and put together a wonderful group of panelists and professions, professionals to engage in this conversation tonight. I look forward to hearing what they have to say on this timely and important topic. At this time, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Susan Koenig. Thank you. I'm just going to keep the microphone here because what we're going to have tonight is a conversation. So um, uh, I echo all of the thank yous, and especially to our panelists uh, and to Carol Wayne, who is really my partner in making this happen here tonight. So. Uh, I am uh, really thrilled uh, at the depth of life experience and professional experience of our panelists here tonight. Uh, not only um, will you hear from people who are trained to help us understand what compassion fatigue is, because there are many in the room who, for whom this is the first time they've really been introduced to the term. Uh, and uh, you'll see that they have life experience and stories that will help you understand why uh, in a community of lawyers and doctors uh, and professionals in our fields, uh, it's critical that we understand this topic. So uh, if I may start with introductions uh, to my immediate left, uh, Jay Tice, uh, who is a licensed independent mental health practitioner who's worked in the mental health field for over 15 years. She's the co-founder of Omaha Therapy and Arts Collaborative, uh, and Jay is specialized in training in trauma folks, cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR, and compassion fatigue. She's a certified, uh, she's certified both as a trauma professional and a compassion fatigue educator. Welcome, Jay. Next uh, uh, to uh, her left is Astrid Munn. Uh, Astrid is a lead attorney at the Immigrant Legal Center, where she represents clients who survive violent crimes, domestic violence, and severe forms of trafficking. She's an adjunct law professor at the University of Nebraska College of Law, a formal, former personal injury attorney, and an advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, including mentoring first-generation college students. Thank you, Astrid, for being here. And then finally, uh, we have Dr. William Lydia, who is a fellowship-trained head and neck surgical oncologist. He has a deep interest in improving the quality of life and reducing depression among patients dealing with head and neck cancers, uh, which is his area of expertise. Uh, Bill is the recipient of the Distinguished Service Award from the American Head and Neck Society and professor at Creighton University School of Medicine. How about a round of applause for our panelists if we can have So, um, Jane, uh, tonight when uh, I was talking to a few folks before we began, um, uh, some folks were saying, you know, I don't even know what compassion fatigue is. So uh, maybe you can just start us off with a little, uh, a little foundational uh, education, if you'd be so kind. And, and Jay's just checking out her mic for the first time here, so um, um, we'll, we're going to go slow here. Okay, everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. So nice to see you. Um, so, compassion fatigue is a term that's very overwrong. Louder? Are you okay? Um, in the mental health field now, but I think it's finding its way into the medical and now the legal field and becoming a little bit more um, well known. Um, it's also known as the cost of caring, and it's essentially um, a condition that occurs when there is an erosion in our ability to be engaged, to be empathetic, and to be compassionate with um, the clients and the patients that we work with as a result of our exposure 
to secondary traumatic stress, which is essentially the stories that we witness from our clients, from our patients, from their families, as we hear their traumatic stories and experiences ourselves. Um, this is something that just, it changes us over time. The first time I ever heard about compassion fatigue was in 2012, and I was working as a hospice social worker and grief and loss counselor at a hospice agency here in Omaha. And that particular year, we had a younger client um, who had a very aggressive form of brain cancer. And so I worked with this client and her husband from home care through palliative care and then to hospice. And then after she passed, I provided grief and loss counseling to her husband. Um, and around that time, I also started noticing that I was kind of like, um, I've been kind of off so <laughs> um, I started noticing that I was spending more time in the office doing paperwork, which none of you know me, but that's totally not my jam. And I was like, this is really weird. Why am I doing paperwork instead of seeing my clients? And so as I reflected a little bit about this, what I realized is that the majority of the individuals that were coming on to hospice were going to die. You know, we were going to lose them. Um, and as a grief and loss counselor with the families, the one thing that they really needed that I was never going to be able to accomplish was to bring their loved ones back to them. And I was overwhelmed with my inability to be effective with these families and with these clients. And so around the same time, a fellow Canadian, Francoise Metsu, came to present on compassion fatigue. And I attended that first training in 2012. And then I just, I wanted to bring it to everybody because, uh, you know, at that time I was working with teams of nurses and doctors and interdisciplinary teams, and they all needed to know about compassion fatigue. So I just got completely immersed in it. Um, there's, uh, I think, a little bit that we take from every ladder closer. Okay. It sounds really loud to me, so I just don't want to be overwhelming. And no, if I break out the no, song, it's going to be really obnoxious. <laughs> um, so I feel like every family and every client that I interact with, when I hear their stories, uh, it leaves kind of like a residue on me. And after five clients or 500 or 5,000, that residue really, it gets heavy, right? And, and we start to feel the impact of it if we don't do something to process it. Um, in her book, Rachel Naomi Raymond, she said the, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be impacted by it is as unrealistic as expecting to walk through water without getting wet. We cannot be immune to compassion fatigue, we can manage it, but we will all come into contact. So, Jay, uh, thank you for uh, helping us to see what it is that we're going to be exploring here tonight. And for, for those of you in the room who, uh, say, well, you know, I don't work with dying people, uh, uh, and maybe I don't even work with people with trauma, uh, uh, I'd like to hear um, uh, you, Astrid and, and Bill, uh, why why should we care about compassion fatigue if we're not we're not a frontline worker? Uh, we're not dealing with uh, with death and dying and, and such you know or even serious health diagnoses. Uh, why does this topic matter to the people in this room here tonight? I can answer. Is it on now? Yes. Um, it should matter to all practitioners, legal and medical, um, because uh, compassion fatigue affects our ability to serve our clients and patients. It will eventually erode the quality of our work. Um, and I speak as uh, someone who traffics in trafficking and human suffering. If you are my client, I'm an immigration attorney at the local nonprofit Immigrant Legal Center just down here at 42nd and Center. If you are my client, yours is not a happy case. You are there because you are escaping persecution in your home country, abuse, abandonment, or neglect on the part of your parents, or you have suffered a violent crime that you are now working with law enforcement to investigate and prosecute. I have very few happy cases, and um, I 
And there are a lot of my clients come to me from Central America and they have very similar cultural experiences. It is very easy, if I were not more aware, um, to take the common themes I encounter and the common crises that are reported to me and um, grow cynical. Just keep letting, if I just continue to let the stories accumulate and wear down on me, I can see very easily how I could, um, that could backslide into some burnout and into some cynicism and just turning my clients into tropes that as they come through the door, I'm just like, oh, you're another um, person with HIV from Honduras escaping persecution from their village, and I'm just rubber stamping my way through the day. And that's a huge disservice to my clients and a huge disservice to me and my skills as a storyteller and advocate. So that's why I am worried about compassion fatigue. Also, compassion fatigue goes hand in hand with burnout and all the other problems us practitioners deal with, like, I don't know, alcoholism and substance abuse. So, on to you, Bill. Well, thank you. Um, so, I'll take a, a slightly different perspective and talk organizationally. Um, back in uh, January of 2020, um, I was uh, the newly minted chief medical officer at uh, Methodist Hospital, you know, fat, dumb, and happy, walked in, and two months later, we start hearing this news in China about this virus. And COVID became um, a crisis like nothing I had ever experienced on a massive scale. Um, and I think much many of our uh, countrymen have never experienced something like this. And what I had the opportunity to see is how the multiple layers of the organization were affected by compassion fatigue and stress. But it was a very slow and long process. So when we first heard about the virus, um, we made all our plans. We started talking about, uh, Lindsay and John will remember, we started talking about being on you know, what has been labeled death panels, but trying to basically resource limitation panels where you would be called, you'd be on call, and you'd get called in if we didn't have a ventilator. And how are we going to manage this? How are we going to make that decision? But what we found was that the first wave was actually rather small. It took a long time coming, and when it did come, it wasn't overwhelming. Um, but the second wave was overwhelming. And the people at the tip of the spear, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the pulmonary doctors, the internists, the hospitalists, they're all in, in the hospital, the ED, uh, the people in primary care seeing patients. They were faced with multiple uncertainties. And then you add on that the, what I would say is a crisis of collegiality in our country. And we faced people coming in, spitting and denying that this was a virus, that it was some kind of ploy. And they had to still maintain their compassion for these individuals who literally would be gasping for breath, denying and dying. And it affected them in ways that I don't think we even yet understand um, and have seen the implications fully of. But it also affected the managers in trying to manage how do you, what do you do? How do you help someone who's overwhelmed? You can't give more people. We didn't have people. We didn't have enough equipment in certain areas. At varying times, we didn't have drugs, we didn't have uh, gloves, we didn't have masks, we didn't have uh, ventilators. All of those things were in some kind of relatively shorter supply. Now, we were fortunate here in Omaha. We hit the, the brink, uh, but we never went over it. We never hit a, a true uh, full-blown crisis level of care, 
But we did on individual cases and in individual rooms in the ICU where the nurses and the respiratory therapists had, were just spent. They had nothing left to give and the managers were spent. And I would say that we've probably lost as many managers as we've lost um, frontline workers because it was so hard and so stressful and they ran out of compassion because the, the nurse was giving compassion and loving the patient. The managers were trying to give them compassion and loving their staff, but there wasn't anybody left. And so they would go home and no one really could fully help and understand. So I think it matters to all of us because the web of connection is so close um, and so interconnected with the people we interact with on a daily basis, that we need to have an awareness for what compassion fatigue is and for how it can become manifest. Um, and it's something that's variable. It's like anything in life. You can take so much, uh, but you get a breaking point, and there are things that make it worse and things that make it better. And uh, I look for Jay to give us, uh, I'm sure, some advice on those things. Bill, I love that you speak to the web of connection. Um, you know, uh, there are uh, people in this room who who uh, weren't working in, 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 a, in a medical setting where COVID was having a, a, a major impact, and there are people, you know, doing mergers and acquisition law uh, who are maybe going, well, yeah. Why should I? Do I need to be thinking about this? So, um, uh, how might there be? Um, how might we recognize compassion fatigue? Uh, that looks that we can see. Like how would we even know? Maybe Jay, you can start us off by talking about what are some of the symptoms of compassion fatigue? Because maybe it's occurring in places that we is it possible to occur in places we don't know that it exists yeah, absolutely uh, i think with compassion fatigue it can look a lot different for everybody um, but generally we see physical symptoms we see emotional symptoms and we see behavioral symptoms so physical symptoms are things like you know we all have our friends who everything causes a gut issue with them you know we carry our anxiety in our gut um, and we know there's a lot of cardiovascular issues that can come from that constant chronic stress of being overwhelmed. Uh, we go into that fight or flight mode, so our heart rate's constantly increased. We're constantly having these additional hormones being dumped into our body that are not meant to rage there for so long. Um, and I think that's one of the things with COVID that we were talking about is, you know, it's, it's resolved to a place that feels manageable, but now we're seeing this huge mental health wave come after the medical side of it has sort of become mastered and I think part of that is people coped and coped and coped for so long in this you know fight or flight mode to just get through it that at some point those resources dissolve and then then we see this is where we're seeing all this mental health fatigue show up in a lot of our organizations so there's those physical symptoms that we notice um, emotionally people become irritable um, grumpy, withdrawn is a big one. We talk about that love of connection. One of the things that we see that's one of both the greatest risk factors and the protective factors is connection. So one of the first things that happens for people who are compassion fatigued is they begin to withdraw, right? Because we think, okay, if I cut out lunch and I work 30 more minutes, or if I don't go to coffee, I can get more done. I can maybe get caught up. Um, but that withdrawal from connection also cuts off a really protective factor for us in our agencies and our organizations. So we see a lot of those kinds of emotional changes. Um, we see family relationships being impacted. Uh, we don't have as much resilience when we, once we walk in the door. I always know as I approach the door at home and I've got my two German shepherds running towards me and my two teenage boys running towards me, whether or not I've done enough to cleanse myself of my day, to be able to walk in and be present for my kiddos at home. There's a funny story about a nurse who um, brought her daughter to a 13 year old to take your child to work day. So the daughter came with her and kind of followed her around her day and saw what happened. 
And at the end of the day, they're driving home, and their mom says to her, well, you know, what did you think about that? What did you learn today at work? And her 13-year-old looks at her and says, I learned that you're a whole lot nicer at work than you are at home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we give all this energy, but at some point, we're going to run out of reserves to give to actually the people that are really the most important to us, which are our partners and our fur babies and our children. And the last one is behavioral symptoms. So, you know, we talked a little bit about substance abuse. Um, there's a lot of numbing that occurs, whether it's death by chocolate or death by vodka. You know, whatever sort of calms that, that stress that's happening all of the time. Um, we see a lot more withdrawal again, a lot more conflict. And then we also see people not making as good decisions, right? Because when we're in fight or flight, we're not using our really good calm thinking brain. We're making decisions on the fly. So that's the other reason I think that it's really important for us to care about compassion fatigue is that ethical care requires that we are present and that we are not fatigued when we're making these decisions. I so speak to what that looks like as a lawyer recently. Um, I was telling Susan and Jay at, during dinner that last Wednesday, just through happenstance of how my um, calendar panned out, I had three back-to-back -back consults on Wednesday afternoon. The first consult was with a trans woman who um, from Mexico who keeps running away with Stockholm syndrome. I know that's probably not a real, you're the clinician, but basically has Stockholm syndrome with their trafficker and keeps running back to their trafficker. and some social workers in town are trying to work with this person and get her to me so I can get her on the right track to stay here safely. That was my first hour. Then followed by the next hour, I spoke with a man uh, who has HIV and was the victim of a hit and run. Um, and that was my two o'clock hour. And then my three o'clock hour, I was talking with, I interviewed one of my clients um, and she, for an hour, we talked about, um, for the purposes of an immigration um, petition about domestic violence that she suffered by her husband, both in Guatemala and here in central Nebraska. And, um, you know, I, I was like, wow, that was a lot of talking with people. Um, and I didn't think much of it, but, you know, um, I, a week later, I'm realizing there was some compassion fatigue at foot because that night I drank a six pack. And I know that might not seem like a lot to some people, but that's really out of the ordinary for me. And, um, and then the next day, I didn't want to touch those files at all. I was procrastinating, and there was just an element of dread of going back and typing up my notes from those consults. Um, so those were my red flags of, like, you need to take a break. And so I took Friday off, and Saturday, and Sunday, and I took Monday off, and that's what I needed. And fortunately, I work at an organization where I'm not afraid to say I need rest um, and I need to be a human. And, you know, come Tuesday, I was able to go back into um, those cases um, with the energy and fresh perspective that they deserved. So Astrid is speaking to um, uh, how there was some delay between um, uh, a really intense compassion experience, series of them, and Jay was speaking to uh, how we cope and cope and cope until we can't. And so, Bill, can, can you help us understand how we are two and a half years now since the beginning of COVID. Uh, why am I one of the lawyers here in the room who spoke, who said to me earlier, you know, I was doing okay up until this summer. And now, you know, I, uh, I don't have anything in me to get. 
So uh, what, what would have been your observations with the nature of compassion fatigue um, unfolding uh, over time? Jane probably will have more to add to this, please. Well, let me start with a story about uh, uh, a friend of mine who's an artist, uh, a guy named Mark Gilbert. He's at uh, UNO and is a professor uh, in the art department. And Mark did a project, he's done a, a number of projects, one called Saving Faces, another called Portraits of Care, which is kind of famous. And, um, he's basically a, a portrait artist who paints uh, groups of people. Um, once it was people with head and neck cancer, another time it's caregivers and patients, another time it was people with dementia. Um, by the way, that show is opening at UNO on Friday. Um, but, one of the projects Mark did for the uh, AMA is he painted COVID warriors, it was called. Um, and basically they were physicians, nurses, uh, respiratory therapists um, who had been working in a COVID ward for a year and a half or more. Uh, about, about, I guess at that time it was about a year and a half. And what he found was that over time, as they were getting their portrait taken, they began to talk and talk. And they were, you know, incredibly emotional because they were finally recognizing what they had been through and how it physically affected them and how it mentally affected them, how it affected their children, how it affected their spouses, how it affected their coworkers. Um, and I think, Part of it is, you know, in, in uh, well, really in a lot of different professions, certainly in medicine and surgery, you need to keep your wits about you. You need to stay focused. A trial attorney, same thing. You know, you can't, you can't be out of control. You've got to be constantly thinking on your, on your feet and suppressing emotion. Um, and you get pretty good at it. Um, and I think that, you know, seeing a lot of bad things, you just get better and better at push, pushing it away and keeping it hidden. And it's not until you really have time to reflect, and I think that's part of what's going on. I suspect that's true of, of soldiers as well. Um, it's when you get into a quiet time and a time when you can reflect and when you're not as busy. And right now, you know, in healthcare we're busy, but we're not COVID busy. We're not, uh, you know, incredibly. So I think part of it is that we're now People are having that moment of reflection, and uh, and they're really reassessing. And the other thing I think that's going on is they're seeing others reflect. Um, and one of the messages of the project that Mark did was that having their portrait done, and this is just one of many different ways you can do this, but allows you that space to reflect and that time because you're sitting, you know, and he's painting you, and you you know you just sit there. Um, and so you start talking and you relax and you start thinking. And uh, a lot of times we just don't do that, especially young parents and um, things that, you know, where you think things are just always on the go. So I think that's part of what we're seeing now. I mean, I, I can't uh, emphasize enough to this audience how the healthcare workers, in particular the nurses and respiratory therapists and, and frontline physicians, gave of themselves um, for an extended and repeating period of time. Uh, it was uh, amazing for me to see and witness what they did um, and incredibly humbling. Um, but unfortunately, when that starts to decompress, that's when I think the symptoms become more manifest. So I'm hearing you say that that, that could happen uh for folks in any in, in any part any arena of life, right? Where finally you have a chance to take your breath, take a breath, reflect, and uh, and then you begin to feel all the feelings that have been there all along. Exactly. In, in fact, you know, I'll go back to Mark. Mark did a portrait study called Portraits of Care, uh, and that was basically one of the messages of Portraits of Care is that we are all at some point a caregiver and someone who receives care. And that moment of vulnerability uh, as someone receiving care, um, and I think even more someone giving care, is when people 
again, have to stay on point. Uh, I did a study of uh, prevention of depression, and I heard repeatedly, uh, you know, head and neck cancer is about two to one males, maybe three to one males. So most, you know, most of the people in the study were males. We gave them an antidepressant to prevent depression. But what I would find is that the caregiver um, was the one that said, look, it, I'm the one that needs it. And, and they would tell their story of, I'm the one watching him in pain. I'm the one watching him choking. I'm the one when he won't eat that's trying to get him to eat and feels guilty because they won't eat. Um, and caregiving is something we all do uh, to varying degrees and we all will do probably at a very you know heavy degree. So I think it's something that we all need to be mindful of um, and something we all may experience at some point because the worst thing in the world is you're, you love someone and you're trying to help them and then you're getting angry with them. And that, moral and cognitive dissonance that's going on with you knowing this is not me, this is not what the way I want to be known or act, but it's so it's such a powerful draw that you, you're sucked in and it just happens. If I'm picturing um, you know, that young professional who is sleep deprived uh, from caring for an infant and has a toddler and, and has to be um, at work the next day, uh, and, and, and. Uh, and uh, when they uh, can observe that they're not being their best self uh, with the people who are precious to them, uh, it might be a, a, a sign. Right, that, that it's time to be taking care of themselves. So, Astrid, you know, you talked about being in a in a workplace uh, that has a, a culture where it's understood that um, it's critical that um, people take care of themselves so that they can be sustainable in the work that they're doing. So, uh, I'd like to hear from from really any of, any of the panelists here on um, what's the role of the workplace culture in um, supporting um, the care that's needed when we're facing compassion fatigue. I guess I can start off by just speaking to audiences very broadly. Um, before I came to Immigrant Legal Sector, Immigrant Legal Center, I was in the private sector, both in the DC, Baltimore area and in Western Nebraska. And it was certainly a, uh, and you know, I was doing immigration law on the East Coast and personal injury law out West. Um, so, I mean, I was not, I was once again trafficking in people's, you know, tragic stories that resulted in deportation lawsuits or medical malpractice lawsuits. I don't know if that is the crowd for that, though. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> and so um, I think there was just a, um, a culture of work hard, play hard, of, oh, that story made you sad. Here's a tumbler of whiskey. You're a big girl. This is how you know, push it down with some brown kind of thing. Um, and that was kind of the uh, culture I, you know, cut my teeth in. And it wasn't that really um, can't work in an immigrant, in the nonprofit sector where you're not doing, you're not um, getting giant bonuses at the end of the year based on how many billable hours you cranked out. In the end, you're really doing this work because you want to have deep, sustainable impact to make our communities in Nebraska a more welcoming place to immigrants. Um, you're not going to get there by working hard and then playing hard. You're going to get there by working hard and resting hard. And so um, recently, I mean always, I think Immigrant Legal Center has um, tried to be welcoming and supporting work-life balance, especially for working parents. But more recently, they're taking more um, additional measures, including unlimited paid time off, um, so people don't have to worry about scrimping and saving their vacation time and then end up using the vacation time to go get their oil changed or something. They have feel free to take the time they need to take care of personal matters, family matters, 
and then just rest. Um, and you think, oh my gosh, isn't that just anarchy now? But no, um, we, I, as far as I know, no one's abusing it. And um, I think if there's anything that speaks to its efficacy is that we keep getting more funding and we keep growing. So that's Immigrant Legal Center. <laughs> One of the things that you said earlier too, you were talking about the stacking of your clients, and I think that that's something that we can try to do is manage our workload by not putting all of our most traumatized clients or most difficult clients in the same same time frame, giving ourselves breaks. Um, you know, in a perfect world, we could all work part time. That's supposed to be one of the greatest factors that mitigates compassion fatigue, but I don't think that that's a reality for everyone. Um, the other thing that I've done a lot of work in over the last couple of years is reflective practice consultation and supervision through UNL. And essentially, what we were talking about earlier is how when we're sitting with somebody, these stories come out. And really, that's what therapy is about, right? I say what's on my mind and in my heart to another person, and when it comes back to me, it sounds different, or I have a new insight or a new reflection. And reflective practice is really about that for professionals, that we do our best work when we are holding the space for our clients, but we can't hold the space for our clients unless we are well connected with how we are feeling inside. And so it gives us an opportunity to sort of, like I say, unravel the spaghetti noodles in a safe space so that when we go back, we're ready to connect with with our clients or with our patients. So I think reflective practice supervision or meeting with other people in your organization is another really healthy way to manage compassion fatigue. Jay, can you say a little bit more about what, what is, if I'm at, if I'm at the office, uh, I'm at work, and I want to be that space, be that uh, place where people can be in my presence and have what they need to um, feel supported, cared for, so forth. What, what does that look like? Can you, just, can you say a little bit more about that? I'll see if I can condense that into a, a short snippet. Um, the first thing is to connect with where you are at emotionally, uh, if you can, and take a couple of breaths and center yourself. You know, we've all had that reaction of we're already kind of up here and then somebody cuts us off when we're driving and then we just like oh, all these things come out of your mouth that you didn't even know you could say <laughs> um so when we are providing a safe space for somebody else the first thing is that we want to center ourselves and kind of say okay where am i at can i take a few breaths can i be ready to receive this person um, the other thing is that we want to meet people with where they're at so if somebody's coming in with all these feelings and I start going on the to-do list of what they need to do next, we're not in the same place, right? I need to join them in their feelings and help validate that before we can move into doing. Or maybe someone's in doing, and the last thing they want to do is talk about what they're feeling. So kind of trying to get a sense of where that person is at and join them, and then support them as they go through problem solving. So what advice would you have for um, this room full of experts? Because uh, we all make our living with people coming to us and expecting us to have answers and do something. So, um, uh, how do we have the both and? Can you, can you, I know that I'm going to put you on the spot here, but uh, uh, can you help us with that? Because, you know, our mindset is this is what I went to law school for, this is what I went to medical school for, so that when people come to me, I can do something. And I'm hearing you say that there's something that happens before the doing, and I suspect that's probably the being. So yes. can you say a little bit more about that? I can, and we actually have a term for that. We're called the fixers because people come to us and we're going to fix that problem, damn it. But there is a space. So I always say I am the expert in therapy, but you are the expert of yourself. And so there is a beautiful marriage that comes when we hear people tell their perspective, and then we use our skills to get to a problem-solving place. So I think that's how you can modify and adapt your style is first try to get a really good understanding of where that person's coming from, and then move into, I call them information drops, about how we then move them through feelings into doing. So, uh, sorry, still learning here. Uh, Bill, if, if you would take us back to that question about uh, uh, workplace culture, and um, uh, Astrid works at a nonprofit, but uh, a lot of us are in workplaces uh, that are not nonprofit, 
And so what is what role has pro the, the pressure for profit uh, had on our capacity to both you know be compassionate and um, uh, cope with the massive uh, compassion fatigue that's happening? Well, so, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think, uh, you know, we live in a capitalist society and it functions actually very well. I think we have a, you know, I'm in a nonprofit as well, but we all make money with what we do. And so um, I'm not sure that's where the rub is, actually. Where I think the rub is, is um, we, we, uh, don't we come out of balance in our sense of being drained without filling ourselves up? I mean, I, I'm not sure money has all that much to, I mean, really, I don't think it has all that much to do with it. I think it's much more about what, why did those nurses keep going into rooms? Because there were rooms that people were suffering in. I mean, and I think by and large, we're driven, uh, especially in a group of professionals, we're driven more by that internal feeling of what is meaningful to us and how this work can help us to achieve our purpose, our meaning. And that to me is really the secret in trying to get back to health, which is understanding that you do have a very profound sense of meaning and purpose and you are delivering on and you can, you've done a lot. Uh, the problem, you know, I guess personally is I always feel like I haven't done enough. That it does, those other 10 cases don't matter. It's the 11th case. That's the one I'm not doing enough on. And I think, so I'm giving advice that I don't listen to. But I think that the, the answer is we have to understand that we have to is in, be in touch with our sense of meaning and fulfillment. And that can be through reflective writing. Uh, that can be through walking and just thinking. Uh, that can be through getting your portrait done. That can be through a lot of different playing music or, excuse me, other things that you may enjoy doing or that give you that space. Um, but I think reflecting on what you do and who you've helped you know, I can look out here and I see people that have helped me um, and they probably have forgotten, uh, but I haven't. And someone is, is here that, you know, you have helped. And whether it's you've, you know, you did something for them uh, on the side uh, in a case or it gave them some advice or whatever, or did a lot, you know, made a big deal. Um, Thank you, Joe Daly. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I haven't forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that's really a, a big part of, of finding that sense of, of health and balance. So I, I heard two things in your answer there, Bill. One was, you know, where is it that I'm finding meaning in my life, right? And, and for many of us, it will be our work. Um, and uh, even those of us who have really meaningful work can also uh, uh, suffer from compassion fatigue. And so we need that other piece that you're describing, which is that how do we fill ourselves up again? So um, Jay, I'm going to turn to you here to, to talk to us about um, in this reality where we're care providers uh, or we're professionals where we're vulnerable to compassion fatigue or we're in systems which make it difficult for us to have the time for reflection or self-care. Um, uh, what can we all be doing to uh, ameliorate um, some of the impact of compassion fatigue? Can you talk us through that? Yeah, that's a good question. And I just wanted to say, Bill, that's actually called compassion satisfaction. It's the flip side of compassion fatigue. So you can now also be a compassion fatigue educator. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I think the finding meaning in our work is is just incredibly important. I have a, a folder in my email and in my office where I put cards or letters or 
uh, stories. I recently came across um, a person that I worked with in foster care for years who is now in the legal field and highly successful after a very traumatic life experience. And so I always say they're like pearls on my necklace or you know, however you want to call that. These are the, the snapshots of what I have done over my career. And it's nice to revisit when you're feeling overwhelmed. The other thing about when you asked about providing space, one of the things about being able to be open about space and connecting is also being able to uh, share common experiences with each other and then give our colleagues positive feedback about what you see about the work that they're doing. And there's a vulnerability in that too, I think, of giving somebody else a pat on the back. And I think in our personal lives, we need to find um, ways of connecting with our family, with our friends. My colleague Betsy Buck and I started an organization six years ago. She's very much into expressive arts. So that's visual arts, writing, movement, um, drama, meditation. And we have been holding open studios for helping professionals for the past six years since we've been open, giving people an opportunity to come in over their lunch hour, reconnect with their creativity, and get rid of some of their compassion fatigue over time. So it's just finding your niche. I mean, you might not be one that's going to come and move around in our studio to, to get loose, but I think any kind of physical activity does help cleanse our bodies of the stress response that we're experiencing. So incorporating movement, incorporating exercise or some other activity um, that feels good for our bodies is really helpful too. Well, we're, we're coming near the end of our time together, and I'd love to hear from our uh, panelists and some final reflections. Uh, there's anything that you, you know, what, what, uh, what, will you what will you take away from either this conversation tonight, or what would you like to have our attendees take away from our time together tonight? No pressure, thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stealing the phrase compassion satisfaction. Good. Take that to my office. Yes. Well, I, I'd like to thank you all for listening and, and Jay, and, and I've really learned a lot from listening to you and, and having your expertise as well. And, and certainly your experiences have been very interesting. Right. So, um, you know, I think that the bottom line is uh, moments like this when you can get together with friends and people like that you haven't seen in a while um, are very meaningful. And those are, again, pretty easy and fun ways to rejuvenate yourself. And so, I commend uh, both organizations for uh, continuing this uh, tradition, which has gone on longer than I've been in practice, which is getting longer and longer. I feel grateful. We were picking out our, what do you call those words? Qualities. Yes, Quality. your qualities um, earlier, or your, your words that you wanted to focus on for tonight, and I didn't have one at the time, but I, looking around the room, I feel really grateful that this many people had an opportunity to kind of think about this as a topic today and um, maybe we'll carry a nugget of that back with you to your work. I'm really big on the ripples in the pond. You know, I feel like I work with one person, but at some point in their life, they're going to impact a bunch of people and, and that feels much bigger than just me. Um, and I guess the other thing is that I hope you go back to your workplaces and tell somebody else that they're amazing this next week too. Well, thank you for giving me uh, some compassion, satisfaction here tonight. I'm really feeling that web of connection with those of you in the room uh, I know and those of you in the room I've never met. By the way, uh, I, I have experienced how present you've been here tonight. So uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, in a moment, uh, Moss is going to close us out. Uh, but how about uh, if we have a round of applause for these? <laughs>